Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's webinar, How to Prepare Your Apps for iOS 14, Test Strategy Coverage and Best Practices. Uh, this webinar is co-hosted by Perfecto and Apply Tools. So uh, before we get started, I just want to say a few housekeeping uh, information for this webinar. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, you will receive the recording uh, in the upcoming day or two. Uh, the slides for this uh, webinar are in the resources folder, so you can uh, get them uh, from there. We do have a Q&A panel. Feel free to use it during the webinar, and we'll do uh, the best we can to address all of the questions during the webinar. For the questions that we cannot address due to the time limitations, we'll get back to you offline after the webinar. With that, I am truly excited uh, to start this webinar. My name is Aran Kinsbuna. I'm Chief Evangelist, Author, and Product Manager at Perfecto, which is a Perforce company. Uh, I've been in this uh, space of mobile and uh, web testing and development for over 20 years now. Author of these uh, two books, Digital Quality Handbook and Continuous Testing for DevOps Professional. Uh, I'm uh, active as much as I can on social, so feel free. Uh, to catch me during or after the webinar to continue this uh, discussion. With that, I am truly honored and excited to welcome Anand Bagmar from Applitools. Hi, Anand, how are you? Hey, Ran, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm well, I uh, hope the same with you as well. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be on this platform and sharing thoughts together. Uh, first time, hoping for many more in the days to come. Um, can you say just a few words for those of you who are not uh, familiar with uh, your work at Apple Tools? Uh, what, uh, what is your role and uh, on what are you working on in your spare time? Sure. Uh, so uh, I've been a quality professional since the past 20 years. Uh, played various different roles with respect to building a quality product, uh, being part of the open source community, being part of the Selenium committee, and I uh, have built some tools with respect to helping testing uh, make more better. So at Apple Tools, my focus is being a quality evangelist and uh, helping solutionize our uh, visual AI offering with our partners and customers. And whatever opportunities I get to be speaking and sharing my thoughts uh, and experiences with the wider community, I jump to that opportunity. That helps me learn a lot from others as well. So that's me, and looking forward now to this session and having a great time here. Thank you, and happy to have you here with us, Anand. So in today's webinar, uh, we're going to actually, we prepared an exciting uh, set of uh, uh, knowledge and information that we have gathered over the past few weeks uh, covering iOS 14 and how to get ready uh, to this new and major release coming from Apple uh, in a month or so from today. So in today's agenda, we are just going to focus on uh, best practices and strategies for your testing, which includes both functional uh, and visual testing of uh, mobile applications. We'll touch mostly iOS features, but also make it more generic from a test automation and continuous testing perspective. We will end this webinar with a live demo showing uh, Appium Plus visual testing on the Perfecto and Applitools platform. So uh, truly recommend you to stay with us uh, until the end. As mentioned, Q&A, feel free to ask us any questions during this webinar. So let's start with uh, a quick overview for iOS 14. iOS 14 is already today in a mature beta. It's in public beta uh, 4 towards 5. And uh, Apple is actually uh, rolling out some very new but also disruptive features and functionalities in this new platform. Uh, just to name a few uh, of these announcements, we are looking at uh, new ability to customize widgets and uh, place them uh, anywhere on your iOS uh, screen, iPhone uh, devices. New changes to app library, organizing the apps in a library uh, view changes to notification, a new translation application, enhanced Siri, a new browser, new Safari browser, Safari 14, enhancements to the car key and CarPlay. So tons of enhancements, tons of visual and UI changes and functionalities added by Apple to uh, the new platform. Uh, in addition to these changes, um, Apple is going to introduce, uh, as part of the Mac Catalyst, the ability uh, to run application clips, 
and also uh, deploy iOS applications on a Mac device, Mac OS devices. So uh, these are kind of major changes that Apple uh, is introducing. Uh, just to say a word about the application clips. So if you think about uh, full native application, application clips are just uh, a link. It's not a full application. It's a subset of the native app that can be accessed either through uh, NFC or uh, a scanning of a QR code uh, with your iPhone device, giving you the exact subset or feature of the entire app without the need to download the full-blown application. Obviously, it saves time, it gives you more value, and saves you uh, memory on the device if you do not need the full application at that time. Obviously, this requires a superset of testing that needs to be added if, in case you support the application clip. Uh, and this is something that Apple is starting to roll out and emphasize uh, to its customer and developers community. So just in these two slides, you have seen uh, a large amount of changes that Apple is introducing in iOS 14. Uh, but it's not the end. It's also coming together with a new set of iPhone 12 devices. We are looking at at least, uh, I think, four new iPhones. Uh, one of them is going to be with a new screen resolution. And th these are going to be most likely roll out in October uh, with a slight delay. Usually they are being rolled out uh, during the September month. Uh, with the current reality, Apple is uh, pushing them a bit forward and uh, the anticipation is going to be uh, having these devices in the market during the October timeframe. From my, uh, my experience and also Anand, we, we took the latest iOS 14 beta and tried to play with it across multiple uh, and major applications coming from different, different verticals. Uh, some of them are enterprise uh, applications, some of them are travel, media, and uh, others, and we have gathered just a few uh, quite significant issues. So the main point behind these issues is not to say that these apps uh, are not good enough, it's just to give ads up to all of you online to really start testing today on iOS 14. You have a public beta, and <coughs> sorry, it can really give you uh, the uh, early alerts and uh, early identifications of issues that uh, might already exist in your application. Knowing them sooner than the GA that is launched in September will also give you uh, the ability to fix them faster and avoid you know, uh, rushing into them once the GA is out. Obviously, looking into this iOS uh, 14 testing activities today, will also uncover issues that you might have with your existing Appium <laughs> or Espresso XUI test that you already built uh, for your iOS and uh, also Android application, by the way, uh, because typically uh, uh, per each iOS release, there are impacts to your Appium scripts. So obviously debugging them today against the latest version uh, would, make, would make a lot of sense. So from a collection of uh, applications that we ran through uh, iOS 14 in the Perfecto Cloud, we were able to see a crash of uh, the Bank of Colorado, the native Bank of Colorado crashes on the iOS 14 beta. Uh, the Lowe's application uh, actually is uh, working fine on iOS 13, but crashes on iOS 14 when you try to log in due to a memory leak. We actually captured the exact line uh, in the logs that causes the memory leak and uh, therefore the crash. So already we are seeing a different memory consumption by the new iOS 14 platform together with uh, simp simply uh, compatibility issues with other applications. <laughs> Uh, Metro Bank application also crashes, works fine on iOS 13 and crashes on iOS 14. Uh, in the Southwest application, we are seeing UI issues. These are things that, for example, uh, a, a solution like Apple Tools would uh, capture. And looking at the left side of iOS 13 uh, on iPhone, I think it was iPhone 7, you see the full text fields for username and password. These are kind of uh, truncated on iOS 14. 
and cannot be uh, actually seen on the iOS uh, 14 devices. Uh, a new version of iOS 14 and also Southwest application was released, um, I think, last night from what I've checked. So I, I will need to check if this bug actually uh, is going away. But these are just a few examples of bugs across different uh, segments, visual, uh, memory, and functionality that uh, were already captured with iOS 14, meaning you need to really start testing today. So with this short intro to iOS 14, the features and some pitfalls, I want to move next to uh, functional and visual strategy and hand it over to you, Anna. Thanks, Aran. Uh, you've actually got me really excited by talking about these new features. As an end user, I'm really excited to see how these features uh, will work and how I can play around with those. At the same time, as a tester uh, in this field, I'm even more excited how I can contribute to testing these apps and it's not just native apps for that matter, right? It would be mobile web as well, which gets impacted uh, in the new version of iOS that comes up. So uh, it's excitement all around from a user as well as a professional perspective. So with that, what kind of functional and visual test strategy can help us build good quality products and make sure it works fine in this new version of iOS? Let's go through some of these aspects quickly. So the first thing is, I don't really think about a test strategy or a test plan. I like to think about what is a good quality strategy for your product. And a quality strategy means how can I build quality into the product, build it good inside out, and as part of that, what types of testing activities are going to help to build a quality product? How can automation help get good, good feedback on how my product is expected to be working? And especially when it comes to native apps, it is extremely important to think about what the release strategy for the app is going to be and how am I going to measure the feedback from what I have released because it is extremely essential to look at that. The app release cycles for native apps is very different and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the next few slides as well. So from a quality strategy perspective and how to build a quality in, I typically look at, this is my template of sorts, this is my blueprint. I want to think about it from the top-down approach. So what is the features that are getting introduced in this new release? What are the business requirements and how can I really understand that better, what the impact of those features is on the end user? And then when the feature gets broken down into user stories for the actual implementation uh, perspective, again, think about that user impact, not just about testing the acceptance criteria, think holistic over there, how is that going to fit into the big picture? From the implementation perspective and how you start testing it, DevBox testing is a very important activity where before the developers move on to implementing the next set of features, test the story along with them, test the functionality along with them, maybe on their machine itself, and find out if there's anything obvious that they might have missed out, give them that feedback so they can fix it quickly. The overall approach is about how can we prevent defects going out and uh, focus on uh, that activity. After the DevBox testing, there has to be thorough testing that is done at a story level and mostly from an exploratory testing perspective, risk-based perspective. Test what has not implemented, test what has not been automated, test the edge cases, the boundary values, whatever you can think of from a change perspective how you can add value in making sure there's no regression that is creeping in, plus new functionalities working as expected. And of course, the responsibility of testing does not end over there. Involve the other roles, add that story level itself, add the feature level in making sure you give them a demo of what is going on, have these different roles, play around with the functionality, give feedback quickly, so that if there's any change required, that can be done uh, before the product gets close to the release date. Automation plays a very big role in all of this because you cannot be repeating the same activities every time uh, in a manual fashion. So whatever makes sense to be repeated from a validation perspective has to be automated. Look at the test pyramid, think about what different types of tests can be automated to get that feedback as quickly as possible to the team. Uh, and the team means the product owners, developers, QAs, and business analysts, uh, more business intelligence folks, uh, whoever else that makes sense from a product perspective, get them involved so they can look at this 
and give that feedback uh, quickly. So the different types of tests, which most commonly I've seen that apply to all these uh, products as unit tests, integration tests, functional tests, functional tests, which actually focus on the end-to-end -end journeys or the user journeys, visual testing, which is a very important aspect, especially based on the examples that Iran already showed, and analytics testing, which is not thought of as much, but without good analytics, you're going to be lost in terms of understanding how your product is really used by the end users. And of course, when you spend all this effort in doing the automation, the value uh, is seen only when you run these tests as often as you can on every change that is done by the developers, making sure you run these tests, look at the results and take action on the results. Only then you'll be able to fix it quickly and prevent the long defect cycle that is there. The focus from a end-to-end uh, -end perspective and functional perspective definitely needs to add an aspect of thinking about how the real users are going to be using the product. And the real users could be having various different personas. It could be an admin of your product uh, who is setting up uh, different configurations or schemes or values or, or coupons, whatever. And it's actually the end users who are ending up using the product itself. And when you think about uh, these behaviors and interactions from end user perspective, also think about how can you best test these functionalities? You know, would a simulator help? or do I really need a real device to test this on? And based on those uh, thought process, based on the understanding, you know, formulate your strategy and think about the implementation for those types of tests. From a release perspective, these aspects are critical again, and unfortunately, I have not seen too many QAs thinking about these aspects. We've already spoken about the in-house testing, what can be done to test the product before it goes live, but you also need to think about, does my product need on-field testing, which means real users, using the product in the uh, in as if it's in production and giving you feedback. This can happen in various different forms. Beta releases is one uh, way where you can get feedback from on-field testing. In many cases, there are actually teams who are representing or available in different geographies where your users might be, and they actually do the testing over there because nothing beats a real uh, uh, testing from network situations and climatic conditions also play a big aspect in terms of how the devices perform. So that aspect is very important. Now think about stage releases. You know, can I do a big bang release approach or do I need to release it in uh, small increments? And when I do the release, how am I gonna capture the sentiments of my users based on the review comments or social media, or how am I going to look at the feedback that is coming in in form of analytics, crashes, support tickets, that gives me a sense of quality uh, of the product which you might have missed in the in-house testing. So now coming back to the new version of iOS, what does what needs to change in your strategy from this use case perspective? Do you need to do any changes? Of course, yes. We've already seen a couple of uh, examples from Iran earlier why such testing is extremely important. So some high level aspects to think about when you're looking at testing your products in this new version of iOS is how quickly can you validate the compatibility of your product on this new version. And compatibility will come from various different aspects. Is the functionality, is the gestures that the OS support, supports or the device supports, the user experience of uh, that particular product, the memory issues, installations, whether it's a new installation or you're upgrading a thin a version of the app on your machine or on your device. What about the integrations and permission issues that might creep up uh, on this new version of the OS for an existing app? What about caching and data storage and how does that impact your functionality as well? So there's a lot to think about over here, a lot that needs to be tested. And of course, again, automation will give you a very quick uh, sense of which direction you need to focus on more when you're looking at getting this app running on a new version of the OS. So I hope this gives you an idea about what should be a functional and visual testing strategy, why that is important, and what are the things that you need to start looking at for your own product when you start playing with iOS 14. Over to you, Iran, for the next steps. Sure, thank you, thank you, Anand. I think this is a great summary, it's a great strategy uh, to build a, a, around your mobile native application. And as Anand mentioned also, if you have uh, even today a responsive web application, uh, it also needs to capture iOS 14 because iOS 14 is coming with a new Safari version. Together with this release, you'll get a new uh, Mac OS platform, Big Sur. So you're going to have a new 
configuration of desktop and Safari together with a mobile and a new Safari browser. So it's not just the native apps, it's also the web application that needs to be uh, validated. And this means, going back to the previous slides that Anand was sharing, that you need uh, obviously to automate your test cases, but also for the existing test cases that are running today as part of your CI, CD, or any build acceptance testing or pull request acceptance testing, you need to make sure that these scripts are still working properly against the legacy platforms and as well as the new platforms. And if there are kind of an if and else or switches that you need to put into your scripts to make the right uh, you know, balance between the new platforms and the old ones, this needs to happen today because really the time is uh, running quite fast and uh, the new platforms are just uh, around the, co the corner. So when we're talking about strategy, I also think that you want to uh, embed in the strategy uh, the te test automation coverage guidelines. And this means <clears throat> what to test and on which platforms to test. And uh, when you think about just taking iOS 14, even though this is a generic statement here because from a business perspective if you are releasing a product and you are not testing using the right high value test scenarios or you are not testing against the right platforms that your end users are using and in production you are risking in escape defects to the to uh, to production. So this is just uh, two sides of the same coin. You want to have the right balance between A, the platforms that you're testing, and B, the test scenarios that you care mostly about. It's not one versus the other. These are two going together. And in the next few slides, I'm going to show how you actually build a right coverage, the right coverage strategy, uh, tuning it mostly to the iOS 14, but you can definitely apply it to generic coverage scenarios for test automation. So when you talk about test coverage, and uh, in my past uh, three or four years, uh, I initiated something that uh, in perfecto we call the test coverage index report. This is a report that simply guides the market on which web and mobile platforms you want to test because these are the most significant ones from a testing perspective. These are the subset of platforms, mobile and web, that if you test against them, you will reduce the risk uh, significantly of escaping defects. And why is that? Because we are, uh, I am actually uh, looking at the market as a whole, uh, dividing it into different geographies, around 10 different geographies, and putting the right mix of devices with operating systems, with pixel per inch, with uh, legacy and new operating system, giving you all the different permutations that you can think of to reduce the risk of a device or platform specific issue. Okay, if you've seen uh, my previous slide on iOS 14 with the Bank of Colorado and the Metro Bank and Southwest Airlines, you have seen that there, these were specific issues, okay? And these specific issues, in my mind, wouldn't have been reproduced on all devices on, uh, or on uh, virtual ones like simulators. So this is why you do want to have a solid test coverage strategy. And in this case, in this index, uh, if you need a link to download it and you cannot find it, just reach out to me. Uh, I will be able to point you to, the, to this report. But basically, I'm looking at three layers. I'm looking at the most essential coverage, which covers the top 10 must test on devices. I'm looking at the enhanced one, which is a superset of the previous one, obviously adding 15 more devices. But these 15 more devices are uh, starting to build the long tail of the market with new and emerging devices, legacy devices that are still with a significant market share and so forth. So once you look at this strategy and apply it in your lab, you can really get a uh, better coverage, better quality feedback to your developers and less risks of escape defects. Obviously, and my clients are doing so as well, 
are looking at both uh, reports such as the index, but also examining their web traffic analytics to see which devices and uh, you know user agents, browsers are hitting their backend services on an uh, ongoing basis. So with that, plus this market report, which is individual, uh, you know, it's not uh, something that is specific to a client. The merge gives uh, each client the right mix uh, on what to test on. And one last comment on that is that everything that I'm showing you in this slide is fully dynamic, okay? In a quarter, you, you would see each month a new browser version being released, a new or even few mobile OS versions, new smartphones. Just uh, this month, um, Samsung released a new generation of the Samsung Note series, Note 20. Um, so these devices are obviously going to be emerging and growing. I would assume that they will be in the extended for now because they are still just new. But in a quarter or two from today, they will definitely be uh, in the top list of either enhanced or sometimes even reach uh, up until the essential coverage. So the market is dynamic and so should your test coverage guidelines uh, and strategy be so as well. When you specifically look at coverage and iOS 14, because this webinar is fully dedicated to iOS 14, iOS 14 actually is not going to make the lives of developers and testers easier because uh, as a matter of fact, it's going to support almost all of the devices that are currently running on iOS 13. So depending on the adoption rate, uh, at, at a given stage, let's say in a quarter time when uh, iOS 14 is out, you may need to test on both of these devices because the end users may lag behind uh, by you know, upgrading to the new version. Because you can see here, it's a long list of platforms that are inheriting uh, iOS 14 and jumping from iOS 13, which by the way is right now on almost 92% of the market for Apple devices. Uh, but think about these devices and add four new devices, which are the iPhone 12 series, you get a very good uh, amount of devices to test on. And this is where you need to be smart about it and do the right segmentation between the devices based on the family, okay? The family can be the screen resolution, the screen uh, pixel per inch density, uh, the generation of the device, the OS compatibility, and uh, also history. If you have quality history issues, let's say on an iPhone X, or iPhone 8, for example, obviously this device will be a very hot device for you to continuously test against, maybe both iOS 13 and iOS 14 for a while now, just because you know history shows that you had uh, some uh, you know defects specific to this platform. So obviously, look into your analytics, look at this list, plus the new iPhone devices, iPhone 12 devices, and see what is the right subset for you uh, keeping in mind the previous slide uh, on the strategy with essential enhanced uh, and so forth. Same goes, by the way, for browsers. Think about Safari 14 with Mac OS uh, Big Sur that is coming uh, as a new configuration for your Selenium grid. If you want to look at uh, my recommendation, uh, you can look at the following. So iPhone 12 is going to be um, expected during October with these four different configurations, uh, with the one uh, new configuration that is going to be uh, potentially the iPhone 12 uh, Pro. But you can see here that you have uh, like two devices. All of them, by the way, are going to be 5G enabled, but there is kind of an iPhone 12 Max and an iPhone, iPhone 12 Pro. The, the Pro Max is an uh, extension of the iPhone 11 Pro Max that is available today. Uh, so four new devices. And if you look at the operating systems, I would at least recommend to look at the GA, latest minus one, latest minus two for your regression testing uh, for both development and testing, as Anand was suggesting in uh, the strategy section uh, of this webinar. Uh, iOS 12.4.8 is the latest, latest minus two, if you like, and it's available on these two platforms, iPhone and iPad. So if you do see traffic coming on these devices, Obviously, it's recommended that you at least pick one of them and configure it. Uh, from a perfecto cloud perspective, we keep uh, supporting devices and operating systems as well as browsers, 
configuration, uh, six and sometimes eight versions uh, older. So you can look at um, the Perfecto Cloud and find both iOS even 11 and 10, but obviously the iOS 12, 13, and 14 beta are fully supported. All the desktop configurations as agreed in the cloud are fully supported by Perfecto. So you can do both Appium and Selenium testing uh, in the cloud together with visual testing, complementing uh, with Apple tools again in the same cloud. And we will soon show it to you how it looks like uh, in the demo. As I mentioned earlier, uh, browsers uh, with iOS 14, even though think uh, about iOS 14, uh, people think about iOS 14 as a mobile thing, uh, obviously it's going, to, it's going to impact the web as well. And what's important to understand is that the trends in the web domain are quite different than the mobile ones. If you look at iOS uh, trending and iOS adoption, it's, qu it's very quick, okay? Looking at the past three years, uh, I would say between 35 to 45% of the users would adopt to the new iOS GA version in a month, okay? It's amazing. If you look at where Android 11 today and Android 10 stands uh, in a different you know, uh, platform, it's way, way be, be, uh, behind, uh, you know, Android 9, for example. Android 9 is the most significant, plus uh, uh, a subset of uh, devices running Android 10. But obviously, Android 11, uh, beta, no one is really, uh, uh, you know, adopting it as fast as uh, iOS uh, platforms. From a web perspective, what you can see is that uh, people tend to adopt and also update Chrome browsers, the latest GA Chrome browsers, much faster than uh, the Safari and Firefox. Firefox specifically takes way too long for users to update to the latest GA. Firefox is a monthly release, okay? Mozilla is releasing a new Firefox GA version each month, but still, from an adoption perspective, people are still, the majority, are running on the latest minus one or even latest minus two, and this is not the case for Chrome. For Safari uh, on Mac, the adoption is a bit uh, it's, it's a bit faster. This is why, again, I recommend to start looking at the Safari 14 beta. Uh, there are a lot of new features added to this browser, and see how your application, how your responsive, progressive, or just mobile web looks like on this new version. Uh, and you need to do so uh, today already. With that, let's uh, move. Uh, a bit forward, and what I was, uh, and we're going to also see it in the demo, what I was uh, trying to finish this session about coverage is that, especially today when we are in a digital reality, that everything is being consumed both by mobile platforms as well as uh, web platforms. I live in uh, in the Boston area in the, in, the, in the US, and this is one of my uh, car providers. And when I was trying to go to, go to this website for my mobile device, uh, what you can see here, there is an animated uh, text or string that simply is uh, corrupted on the iOS Safari on a mobile device. Well, you can see that it looks fine on Android Chrome and uh, on desktop web. But oh, by the way, on a different desktop web, uh, the, you see here all this white space. It's simply, uh, simply wrong, and there is a, a unique layout issue uh, in this website across different platforms. And this is some kind of a responsive web. You would expect that the design and the layout uh, will be better adopted across different screen sizes and resolution. So the bottom line here is that when you're thinking digital, you're thinking both mobile and web, and your testing strategy needs to cover both as early as possible. Uh, and these are just a few examples of both functionality and also visual issues uh, experienced uh, on this website. So this is uh, a nice segue towards uh, really balancing between real devices and virtual ones. Uh, earlier in this webinar, Anand was showing you uh, a slide about a recommendation to test against both real devices, virtual devices, just to get A, as close as possible to the users that you, you can, and B, to uh, put some velocity into your processes, into your development processes. And we know that virtual platforms such as emulators and uh, simulators are really good at. Apple, Apple is providing you with good simulators. 
Google is providing you with a large variety of uh, emulators. Uh, you also have the different OEMs like Samsung uh, and uh, LG and others that also have their own uh, emulators. Uh, but these uh, specific virtual platforms, which are very good earlier in the development cycles, uh, can help you be more agile while you're developing your first uh, you know, mobile application or implementing a new feature, resolving a specific defect. But when you want to get as close as possible to your end user, you really need to have this right balance and mix between the two. And what you also need to understand is that uh, with virtual devices, iOS simulators and Android emulators, this is just a nice, uh, I, I would say, summary and differ differentiation that I prepared comparing the Android to iOS because let's assume you have uh, a native application and you want to test the specific features on a virtual platform for Android and iOS, you will see that even these virtual platforms are not the same across the platforms, okay? For example, when you are testing an Android native application on an Android emulator, can be the Google Pixel emulator or Samsung, you are testing the exact same APK file that you are going to test on a real device. For iOS, you're going to test a different binary. It's going to be the .app file. So you're not really testing the same file or uh, package on iOS simulators and real devices. And that's, I wouldn't say a risk, but this is a difference between both these platforms and the platforms uh, the real ones and the virtual ones that you need to take uh, under considerations. There are also differences in the support for sensors, okay? For iOS, you don't have the face recognition support. Uh, you see some MD MDM unsupported capability. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, background application support. Uh, and at the end of the day, the, the hardware itself, okay? The hardware itself that is running uh, behind the emulators and simulators is your PC, and it's not the one that is uh, being uh, used in the device, okay? So um, this is just, uh, again, it's not something against virtual platforms. It's just to give you the knowledge of the different the main differences between virtual platforms, real platforms, when to use what, uh, and so forth. To make it easier for you, what I've done, I actually put it in kind of a uh, set of consideration uh, when to use virtual devices for iOS versus real ones. So obviously it matters the stage and activity in the software development cycle, whether you're in, in the dev stage, in the test, debugging, design, this is when each and uh, different, of, uh, different platform will serve you best. Cost avoidance, obviously virtual platforms, and by the way, Perfecto, supports both real devices and also virtual devices for both iOS and Android. So you can actually trigger SCI or run your Appium scripts across real and virtual platforms. But obviously the cost of uh, virtual platforms is going to be uh, lower than a real device and it makes a lot of sense. And uh, last but not least is the coverage. I think I covered a lot about the coverage in this webinar, but when you want to get real coverage against the real user conditions, you know, different network virtualization, uh, different location mimicking, face recognitions and sensors and stuff like that, uh, real devices would give you additional benefits that the virtual one wouldn't. And lastly, the testing types. Obviously, when you're doing unit testing and uh, feature-specific testing, virtual platforms will be perfect for that. But when you're doing end-to-end -end testing, uh, build acceptance testing, you want better coverage and you want to be as close as possible to production and to your end users. So if you want to look at uh, some, you know, just a previous slide in a test pyramid format, so this is how, you know, you're going to balance between unit testing, integration testing, UI testing, and manual testing across the different stages of the life cycle, when to use just virtual ones, when to use a mix, and when to only use real devices. And obviously, as you uh, move more towards the right, towards the production, you would care about testing against real devices. Just before wrapping up, uh, I want to show you uh, a nice example of pipeline. Again, a, a, th a triple example of the previous slides, uh, showing you uh, one of my clients that is uh, using this nice pipeline uh, workflow uh, on a daily basis. And what you can see is that it, it uh, has a 10 minute feedback for pull request, 
up to seven pull requests for this client. I actually have clients who are doing 15 pull requests a day. And in this pull request, it has only 10 minutes of feedback. So obviously setting up complex environments and stuff like that, uh, it's not sufficient enough upon each code change. This is where virtual platforms play a better role for this uh, client. But when he goes towards the one hour feedback over lunch, uh, a mix of virtual platforms and real devices makes more sense and the coverage is growing, obviously towards a higher confidence level for the nightly regression where he's only running against real devices. And this is kind of the previous two slides and the pyramid uh, break down into a pipeline of a real client, a real user uh, that uh, we are serving to that perfecto. And this is how he exactly uses uh, the solution. With that, I want to move to the demo. And uh, the demo is going to feature, uh, and thank you, Anand, for putting up this demo uh, for the audience. So the demo is going to feature the Ladur uh, website. It's a responsive website, which unfortunately on a mobile iOS uh, platform, uh, Safari browser, as you can see, uh, and you will soon see in the demo, doesn't, uh, I would say, behave properly uh, there is a duplication of the promo code you can see here promo code or gift card so this string is being duplicated and it's also uh, being placed here under the checkout in the cart uh, uh, screen and uh, with an appium script that um, perfecto with apply tools put together we were able to capture and uh, identify this uh, functional and also visual bug which kind of summarizes this entire webinar so I, I want to uh, quickly show you uh, the demo, and for that I will move uh, back to Anand. Thanks, Aaron. Let's see how we can get started with using of. Let's see how we can get started with using Perfecto and Apply Tools to solve the functional and visual test automation requirements. I have an APM uh, test implemented using Java here. In this case, in the dependencies, I'm adding my Perfecto and Apply Tools dependencies. And then as part of my test, all I have to do is make sure my eyes object is instantiated and configured in the correct level using the right AI algorithms and whatever the settings that are required from your perspective. Then I'm, uh, as part of creating the web driver instance, I'm going to give it my perfecto capabilities that are required to make sure uh, we are able to run the test in the perfecto cloud. Once this is done, you'll be able to start running your tests in Perfecto, and the visual validations will be done as part of Applitudes. When you run the test that we just saw, you'll be able to see the test execution uh, executing live if you go to the live stream option in the Perfecto dashboard, or for past executed tests, you'll be able to see those reports as part of the report library. Here we are able to see in the live stream the device has been launched and the test is running in the mobile cloud. The first time when I ran the test, the test was grouped into these steps as I had configured in my code. Inside each of these commands, you'll be able to see the exact executions that actually happened to run the test itself. I could also play the video of the recording from this particular screen, and I can figure out what was really happening as part of the execution when I ran the test. This test was run against iOS version 12.1.4. The same test, if you see, when it ran against iOS 14, you would notice that there are the same three steps that I actually ran. However, you will see that because of the integration with Apply Tools, and since there were differences found as part of visual validations, the Perfecto dashboard itself says what the result of that validation has been. 
It also gives you the link to the Appy Tools dashboard where you will be able to look at the details of what happened from a visual perspective. In fact, the stack trace is also seen here, which can help figure out quickly what went wrong. This gives a very powerful way to understand from a functional perspective, what is the execution that is going on, which device operating system uh, has it ran. If you have any custom tags that were added as part of a test execution, you will be able to group and filter the test results according to that as well. And the details you know, make it very easy to figure out what is going on. Now let's see what happens on the Applitool side when we run these tests. The first test that ran, which was against iOS 12, we see the results captured as here in the Applitool dashboard. If you inspect each of these results, you will notice one interesting thing. There is no baseline image against which this particular screenshot or screen was compared. However, the test is marked as passed. This is because Applitools takes care of the baseline management for you. Rather, it makes it extremely easy for you to create baselines and update baselines across all different configurations of browsers, viewport sizes for you. So the overhead or the headache, if I may say, is not on you. Applitools will take care of that. So in this particular uh, case, because the test ran the first time on this particular configuration of iOS and Safari at a particular resolution, Applitools created this as baseline automatically for you, and it has saved it. The next time when you run the same test, you will notice again uh, the same test, you uh, see that this has been marked as unresolved. Now again, Applitools will not automatically fail the test for you unless in very specific cases. What it does do is using the AI algorithms, it will find out accurately, is there any difference in the image that has been captured with the baseline? And if there is a difference found, it is going to mark it as unresolved for you because only the team members know if the change of the screen has seen, is it because of an evolved functionality of your product or is it because of a regression that has been introduced? Either case, only the team member can know what is the reason for it, and accordingly, the team member can take a decision on that. So now in this case, let's look at what type of results Applitools is showing to you. If I highlight the differences, all the regions in pink are basically what Applitools is saying are the differences found on the screen when you're using the strict algorithm. The strict algorithm is an AI power algorithm which mimics the human eye and brain. It is going to tell you any difference that is seen on the screen which a human can perceive. Now, this makes it extremely easy for you to just come to the dashboard and take quick decisions on, based on the differences found, what should I be doing for it? Here's another interesting thing. If I change the algorithm to a layout algorithm, this is another algorithm where Applitools will take care of ignoring the content for you, but it will focus on the layout aspects of these tests and tell you if there's any difference from that perspective. Now, in this case, it is highlighting a region over here, which from a layout perspective, it you know, thinks is not correct. It is different from before. Notice that it has ignored the difference of pictures or images on the bottom of the screen in this case, because the layout is maintained in uh, the screen. So that is not really a problem. Now, you might say that, wait a minute, this seems to be a problem for me. And if you've got Jira integration in place, you could report this as a defect directly saying, uh, position messed up, and uh, you could file it as a defect. Or, uh, as in this case, I'm going to delete it off, and I'll move back to my strict algorithm for a minute. In this case, you notice that there are so many differences, and if I put the images one on top of the other, you will notice that whatever is really different is what has been highlighted by Apple Tools to you. And the same will go for all the other screens as well. It is going to tell us what is really different about it, and you can take decisions for it. This is what makes it very easy and powerful to integrate functional and visual testing as part of the same test execution. Now you're getting the power of the cloud by running your tests in Perfecto, and you don't have to do as many assertions in your functional tests. Instead, your visual assertions can also, or rather will also include your functional validations and we'll see some more examples of that also shortly, okay? So this was one aspect of 
running the test on the same browser or rather the same OS version. What would happen if I forced this kind of change or comparison to happen across different versions of the operating system? In this case, I have run my test against iOS 14. And now if I have to compare these two screens, look at the amount of differences here compared to what I saw between different runs on the same operating system. Almost the whole screen is highlighted in pink. And if I put this on top of the other, you will notice how much difference is there between these two different operating systems for the same screens to be rendered. And that is a big problem. If you do not do this kind of validation, you will not know what is being missed out when a version upgrade happens, whether it's for the operating system or for the browser versions as well. And that is very important for you to take, uh, to take care of. The power of Apple tools now comes across, not just in web or across the different uh, OS version changes. You could be getting this power, whether it's native applications or web applications. Here's an example of a native application where we are comparing a stock-based uh, app, Yahoo Finance in this case, and we are highlighting what are the differences that you see in these? Now, this is on the same operating system, but the data is dynamic, and AppliTools is able to capture all these differences for you as well. Again, the similar algorithms will work in this case as well, whether it's native or web. Okay. We'll get similar type of validations, whether you're doing localization testing. Now, in this case, because I'm using a layout algorithm, I'm seeing even for different login pages for Facebook, the test has been marked as passed because the layout is maintained. In fact, Aptitudes has some very interesting features as well, which will allow you to, if I come back over here, if you have some experimentation happening in your uh, tests where uh, you've got A-B testing going on, you could create new paths for your application from a visual validation perspective as well. And you'll notice now that this has been marked as passed because I created a new path for it. So that is the reason why we feel that visual assertions, what we really saw is visual assertions, right? You can use a single assertion like ice.check window or different SDKs would have slightly different syntax, but a single assertion can do your functional as well as, well as visual validation for you. This validation does not break when your UI changes because we're looking at what is being rendered to the user, not what is behind the scenes, as should be the case from a functional and visual validation perspective. You don't need to worry about creating or maintaining baselines. AppliTools will take care of that for you. And we've got many other interesting features when you combine AppliTools and Perfecto together that you can get the power of AI and the cloud to make your visual validations and functional validations seamless and get validations happening at the speed of CI and CD that you really need in today's day and age. Over to you, Iran. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Uh, that was a great, uh, great demonstration. And uh, oh, by the way, Anand just made this demo for uh, three devices. Think about uh, connecting to uh, using the Perfecto Cloud and Apple Tools, uh, 20 platforms, web and mobile, uh, getting this nice matrix of different uh, functional and visual uh, insights. Uh, obviously, it saves you a lot of time, but also uh, gives you a good quality coverage uh, and governance of everything that is going on in your uh, application. So again, thank you uh, for uh, putting uh, this demo together, Anand. Uh, before we wrap up this uh, uh, webinar and move to questions, uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, leave you guys, the audience, with a set of uh, useful metrics. Uh, Anand started this webinar with a nice uh, quality strategy, uh, where, which takes into consideration different aspects of testing in different stages of the pipeline uh, with coverage considerations and many more. But uh, you do not know what you cannot measure. Uh, that's what people usually, usually say. So here is just a, a nice set of uh, successful, useful metrics that I've gathered over the past, uh, I would say, year or two uh, from successful enterprises. And if you, you don't re really need to take all of these metrics uh, into your 
business, but if you think it at, uh, or if you look at the different categories like test automation maturity, continuous testing visibility, CI CD pipeline health, uh, tools matching, test coverage, and product quality related, and you pick at least two or three metrics and uh, kind of put yourself like Apple Tools is do, uh, are doing with a baseline, make yourself uh, uh, put uh, in place a baseline of matrix tel telling you uh, where you are today with quality, where you are today with test automation coverage, with test automation creation speed, with test automation reliability, with pipeline health, and then put yourself the goal for improvement, uh, you know, for the next quarter or so. But, uh, you know, without putting metrics and measurements uh, which covers the strategy that Anand recommended to you earlier in this webinar, you will simply don't want to know where you are today and uh, wh what you can actually improve. So I really recommend picking at least a few uh, metrics from each of these categories and applying them into your daily activities. Let's wrap up this webinar. So uh, you have seen in the demo both tools, both uh, Perfecto and Apply tools. Uh, the four pillars that Perfecto believes in as a unified solution for continuous testing in DevOps are having a good creation ability, as you have seen in the demo, uh, the usage of Appium, but uh, uh, you can think about uh, using Perfecto with Selenium and WebDriver.io and other frameworks together with BDD. Um, but having a creation tool that matches your skill set uh, with a, an execution layer that allows you to orchestrate, to trigger all the test cases, as uh, Anand was showing to you, in a uh, governed lab, uh, Perfectos Cloud is, is, uh, is a lab in the cloud for you, uh, which hosts both mobile and web uh, devices, uh, gives you the right amount of capabilities for your continuous testing activities. And as Anand mentioned uh, and showed you in the demo, getting the layer of quality visibility uh, is where you actually get the value from the investments in your testing. So combining the four pillars uh, are, in my mind, the keys for your success. Um, Anand, do you want to wrap up this webinar, say a few words about what Apple tools are doing before we move to the Q&A? Sure. No, thanks. So I'll just take half a minute on this one. Uh, so Apply Tools, as you have seen, is a visual AI solution. We have invented visual AI, and we've got these AI-powered algorithms that really make it accurate for our users to know about the quality of their product if it is picture perfect as per their expectations. We help teams in various different needs, whether it's in functional testing and visual testing. We work across different platforms, web, mobile, for user experience testing. We also have got use cases for cross-browser and device and uh, various others, as you can see on the screen. A testament of, of the power of the solution is you know, a couple of months ago, we crossed more than 1 billion images ac accurately uh, verified using our algorithms overall. And that is a huge uh, testament. Uh, the accuracy rate is 99.49% uh, uh, based on these uh, analysis of these uh, validations and people get a lot of value out of this. Uh, last uh, bit is uh, our you know, platform offers you to ways to work in the speed of CI, CD, you know, providing picture perfect solutions across all the different browsers using ultra fast grid and various uh, different SDKs to allow you to work in the way that your team is working without forcing you to work in a particular way. So with that, uh, I'll wrap up and uh, Iran, we can move to the questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Again, thank you also to the audience that joined and uh, asking questions in the background. Um, Shelby, I know that we ran a bit uh, late because we really prepared a, a lot of content for you today. We wanted to emphasize the importance of uh, continuous testing, uh, functional and visual testing. Uh, but Shelby, if we can uh, at least get uh, two or three questions uh, in, it would be great. Sure. Uh, the first question from the audience is, how essential is it to include visual testing as a part of my strategy? Isn't that an overhead? Oh, no, Iran, I'll take that one. Uh, so uh, it's a good question. Strategy is based on context. It is based on risk that you would decide what is required to be done or not. Iran has already shown us a good few examples. We saw in the demo as well some examples of what can go wrong if things are not tested uh, well 
before it is released to your end users. And every defect that goes out to production has a cost. The cost could be in terms of brand value, reputation, revenue, and losing your users as well. So as with everything, uh, you have to strategize, you have to prioritize. And Iran again showed us, uh, shared some good examples of how you can finish running the pipeline in a few minutes, less than 10 minutes, and you can run a longer suite uh, at different times. So strategize well, prioritize well, and it will give you the returns of investment with that approach. I hope that answers the question. Yep. Next question from the audience is, is it feasible to run UI like functional and visual tests on every build slash commit? You can take this one, Anand. I think you have shown it also in the demo, but feel free to take this one as well. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, so again, I'm going to refer to Iran's uh, example, right? Uh, there are a lot of use cases. If you prioritize your uh, builds correctly, your tests are structured well. If you think about the test pyramid, how can you get the quickest feedback? And you have all these different uh, processes, practices implemented that allow you to enable and that allow you to get that quick feedback, then it is definitely possible to run your tests on every build. Now, again, be cognizant of the fact that just running the test is not enough. You also need to take action on the results that you see. So think about that aspect. Can you prioritize every build run to be uh, looked at by a team who can take decisions on it? Or would you rather wait for a couple of commits to come together and then run your tests? So it's all about strategy, but it is feasible. A lot of companies do that. A lot of customers do that. And it, uh, they see the value out of that as well. Great. <laughs> Shelby, do, right. we have, do we have uh, time for one last question? Yeah, let's do one more. Uh, the question is, why is AI required in visual testing? What value does it bring to me? Ooh, oh, very interesting uh, question. So AI, um, as end user, why should it matter, right? The question really comes down to how accurately can the technology help me uh, tell is this a correct representation of what I expect or not? Typical visual validation solutions uh, you would see are based on pixel matching algorithms, which means any small change in the screen size or uh, the different browsers, for example, can result in differences when you look at from a picture matching perspective. And that's where AI really comes in, you know, that helps you look at from a end human perspective and user perspective, what is important uh, to the user show only that as differences and allow you to take actions on that. So AI has got a lot of power in these use cases and it does make your visual validation very accurate and robust. De definitely, Anand, and uh, you know, just uh, tying it even uh, back to the to this webinar, uh, we have shown you know what's coming in iOS 14, uh, things like appli application clips and new Safari 14, the coverage of different platforms, screen sizes and resolutions, and actually the evidence we are finding so many issues. So definitely uh, to cope with the scale and the differences between these different digital channels, you do want to mix AI and smarter technologies on top of your functional testing. And I think uh, at least I'm convinced after this webinar that you know when you look at Appium scripts together with a Perfecto and Appy tools, you can really achieve a great uh, coverage results and get more insights into your quality of your digital assets. So um, I think this was a, you know, I mean, a great uh, validation during this webinar and preparing the demo that AI is really uh, in the future uh, of testing and uh, obviously can help. So with that, I think that we are already uh, at the top of this hour. I would like to thank first Anand for joining me in this uh, insightful webinar. It was a great pleasure working with you on, uh, in, uh, in this webinar and on the content. So thank you for joining. Thank you, Iran. And uh, thank all of uh, the audience that uh, joined us. We had a great uh, amount of uh, interest uh, in this webinar. So I do hope you enjoy the content and we look forward to engaging with you after this webinar as well. So thank you uh, all and have a great rest of the day. Bye everyone.